We are now in the ruins of the Kuzentnik castle. It was here where on the 11th of July the Grand Master was staying together with all his powers. The intention of Ulrich von Jungingen was simple but effective. Having strengthened the forts of Drvenca with palisades and equipping them with artillery and crossbow men, he wanted to give a defensive battle to the royal troops in a location convenient for him. In view of this difficult situation, Władysław Jagiello called a council of war. During the meeting, it was decided that the troops should not force the Drvenca and the Kuzentnik, but they would march it around at the springs near Ostruda. The next day at dawn, Jagiello's troops went away from under Kuzentnik, leaving surprised Grandmaster, who failed to guess the king's intentions. Marching swiftly, Jagiello and Vitatis left Kuzentnik behind and returned under Vlitsbarkvelski, where they had probably left the military camps. Then they reached near Jaldovo, covering as far as 42 kilometers in only one day. The next day they reached the fortified city of Dombrovno, which was captured and burned after a short storm. The Polish-Lithuanian army stayed in the place of the camp near Dombrovno until the dawn of the 15th of July. That day they probably set out through the villages of Jankowice, Gardyny, Turowo, Brovina and pitched a camp on the south shore of the Lubin lake near Stembark, Grunwald and Lodwigowo. Meanwhile, on the 12th of July, Grand Master moved from Kuzelnik and came near the castle of Bretian, where over 12 bridges his troops crossed the Drenta. Then, between the 13th and the 15th of July, he stayed in a camp near Lubawa. It was probably here where he learned about the burning of Dobrovno. Urged by the nightly guests from the Western Europe, he decided to block the way of the Jagiellonian Union Army and give them a pitched battle. On the 15th of July, through Marwald and Frignovo, he reached the fields among the villages of Grunwald, Stembark, Wodwigowo. Eventually, the two hostile armies met. Knights began to prepare for the battle, which would become famous throughout Europe. Unlike King Jagiello, who commanded the battle from a hill, Grand Duke personally set up his regiments and then took a direct part in the battle. The Polish regiments were placed on the left wing and in the center of the whole battle formation. The Lithuanian and Ruthenian knights, led by Grand Duke Vitatis, occupied the right wing. A stream separated the Teutonic army from the Jagiellonian Union troops. The right Lithuanian wing went into battle first, attacking the left wing of the enemy. Starting a battle with the right wing attack was a common medieval strategy. Soon, also the left wing of the Crown troops joined the battle, attacking the right Teutonic wing. In the first phase of the battle, the famous Teutonic cannons spoke twice, without doing much damage to the attackers. After an hour of battle, Vitatis' troops began to waver and they were forced to retreat, which turned into a panic escape. Impressed by the escape of the Lithuanians, some of the Crown troops who were fighting in the center joined the panic including the banner of St. George, Bohemian and Moravian mercenaries. The Teutonic knights from the left wing of the Odys army, believing that the battle was almost won, rushed in pursuit of the fleeing Lithuanians. However, the triumph was premature. In response, the Polish regiments rushed to help the Lithuanians, among them were the great banner of Krakow, the banner of Sandobierz, of Halic, of Yelun. The field against Teutonic knights was also kept by the Smolensk regiments, led by Duke Lengvenis, Jagiello's whole brother. One of the Smolensk regiments was almost wiped out. Thanks to it, with a great effort, they managed to eliminate the threat. Nevertheless, the situation in the right wing of the Crown troops was still serious. Charges, probably led by Grand Master himself, fought their way three times through the formation of the Polish regiments. It was just this phase of the battle, when Marcin of Racimowice fell holding the Gonfalon the most important Polish banner. According to medieval military thinking, it was just the banner which was used to give the knights signs during a battle. Furling of it was a signal to retreat. 
Therefore, the fall of the Polish banner could result in dire consequences. No wonder the Teutonic Knights started to sing a triumphant song, Christ ist anstanden. Yet, the banner was quickly picked up by the Polish Knights. After the banner had been reclaimed, the Polish troops gradually began to prevail on the right wing. At the same time, also the left wing near Wodwigowo were dominating over the Odes regiments. About 3 p.m., the Grand Master, seeing that the situation became really serious, and his troops started to retreat towards the camp, launched reinforcements of about 16 banners, and together with most dignitaries of the order, led them to the battle. He probably went to the east, then turned round to the right to attack the right flank of the royal army. During this raid, a famous duel took place between King Jagiello and the knight Dipold von Kokeritz, who was attacked by the rich royal armor and attacked the monarch surrounded by his bodyguards. What this was clashed with him wounding the face. The knight was knocked down and finished off by Zbigniew Oleśnicki. The attack of the Teutonic reserves failed. The Polish party also launched its reinforcements and attacked the flank of the Teutonic regiments. What's more, some of the Lithuanians turned back from the escape and joined the battle again. In the clash, the Grand Master and the whole Order's elite died. The total loss of the Order's army is estimated to be as many as 8,000 soldiers, whereas on the Polish side, according to Jan Lugos, only 12 notable knights died, obviously not counting the less imminent ones and the rooted Lithuanian regiments, which were likely to have lost as much as 50% of the initial state. On the 1st of February 1411, a peace treaty was signed in Torun. For the Grand Duke, its most significant provision was that the Teutonic Knights waived the claims to Samogitia, although only for as long as Jagiel and Vitus lived. Despite unfavorable for Poland and Lithuanian provisions under the Peace of Torun, the Jagiellonian Union countries achieved everything they had assumed at the beginning. Together with the end of the Great War, the importance of Grand Duke Vitus increased significantly. Impressed by the order's defeat, the lands previously reluctant to Poland and Lithuania hurried to enter into agreements and alliances with the cousins. The Novogrodians, the Pskovians, abased themselves, as well as Smolensk. After Grunwald, Vitus heavily engaged in the Eastern policy, which had always been the apple of his eye. He appointed Kans, kept fighting against Ras. A symbol of the Duke's power was the new Polish-Lithuanian Union, signed in 1413 in Horodwo. Under its provisions, even after Vitus's death, Lithuania was to be governed by a separate ruler appointed by the King of Poland after consultation with the lords of both countries. On the other hand, the Poles couldn't elect a new king without the consent of Lithuanians and the Grand Duke. To be completely happy, Vitus needed only the royal crown. After many ups and downs, an attempt to take the Czech throne offered him by the Hessites, eventually Jagiello reluctantly agreed to the coronation, over the objections of the Pope and Polish magnates. It was planned to happen in 1430. In October, invited by Vitus, Jagiello went to Lithuania, where the two rulers reconciled again. On the 16th of October, Vitus and Jagiello set out from Vilnius at the head of the retinues. Suddenly, Vitatus fainted and slid from his horse. An old injury renewed. The ill duke was immediately transported to the castle in truck. Vitatus' agony lasted until the 27th of October. In these last days, King Władysław set up by him. Vitatus was dying consciously. Before he died, he had managed to settle many state affairs. On the last day, he called boyars before his face, and in their presence, he gave the authority in Lithuania to Jagiello. Thus died one of the greatest rulers in the mutual history of Lithuania and Poland. An ambitious man, intelligent, sometimes cruel, just like the times in which he happened to live. During his reign, Lithuania was one of the major European powers. Therefore, 
it's right to say that the greatness of Lithuania begins and ends with Vitatis.